Ridgway to now convene and sitting for the regular dispatch of business. The Honorable Judge Paul C. Ridgway is president presiding. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. God save the state and this honorable court. Please be seated and remain quiet. Please turn off all the electronic devices at this time. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead and have Mr. Broyhill brought. Good morning. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm prepared to move forward with the uh, sentencing hearing in this matter. Uh, are there any matters that we need to take up before we move to sentencing? Not from the state, Your Honor. All right. So the court hereby accepts the verdicts of the jur jury and orders them recorded. Uh, I'll hear uh, first from the state with respect to sentencing, and then Mr. Arbor will have an opportunity to speak on behalf of the defense. Judge, thank you. At this time, would it be appropriate for the state to tender some victim impact information to the court? Yes, sir. Your Honor, this is Deborah Funderburg, um, Jamie Hahn's mother. I'm going to ask that. Uh, and her husband, Marion. Uh, that's fine. Our, if, if, why don't you come around here and, and so you can um, speak directly? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I didn't bring a big picture because I've just been holding this one in my hand all day, so I'm going to leave it up here because today is finally about her. My name's Deborah Funderburk, and this is my husband, Marion Funderburk, and I'm Jamie's mom, and Marion is her stepdad. We want to thank everybody, Doug Fawcett, Abby, Karen, Zeke, and everyone else for the hard work they've done to see that the person who took Jamie from us will be punished. We also want to thank every juror for the verdict they returned yesterday. Yes, we were pleased with what happened yesterday, but then we woke this morning and nothing has really changed. I express my sympathy to the Broyhill family. We know that lives are forever changed. The greatest gift I have ever received in my life was being Jamie Kirk Hahn's mother for 29 and a half years. Since Jamie's been taken from us, many wonderful things have been said about her. She was so full of life and loved everything about life. Learning, family, animals, being with friends, meeting new people, providing for others less fortunate as well as we all know a party. She thought that could fix anything. One prominent Raleigh attorney told me a couple of weeks ago that Jamie was so much more than a political strategist, she was a community leader. A dear friend described Jamie yes, just yesterday as pure. I think that is the best word to describe her. I could stand here and go on and on about how wonderful she was, but unless one had the privilege to know Jamie, one would never truly understand what I was saying. She had an infectious laugh that everyone always remembered and a smile that would light up any room. Jamie lived life to the fullest and loved beyond that. Almost two years have passed since I last spent time with Jamie. It was a great few days. I so remember her talking about hoping to start a family before long and that she had just assumed that we would move to Raleigh so I could help with her children and be an important part of their lives. I thought, what an honor. Nation shared with me that at one point in their relationship, Jamie told him that she felt one of the reasons she was put on this earth was to be a mother, and oh, what a great mother she would have been. The last time I saw Jamie, she was in her bathroom drying her hair. She hugged and said how much we loved each and we hugged and said how much we loved each other. John Broyhill was in the guest bedroom pretending he was recovering from gallbladder surgery. We are not the same people we were then, and we know how we never will be, but we do the best we can with the life we have now. That is what Jamie would want. Jamie would do anything she could for people she loved. She was an extraordinarily loyal person to people she loved. Jamie and I were talking on the phone a day or so before she and Nation left for the beach, and she was sharing with me the odd things John was doing in relation to the supposedly pancreatic cancer diagnosis. She went on to say, John is like family, and if this is his way to deal with this, then we are here for him. 
I talked to Jamie Monday morning, April 22nd, and she went on about how their week at the beach had been the best week of her life. I got off the phone realizing how lucky I was as a mother that Jamie was so happy with her life. She was so in love and getting ready to start a family. Little did I know that in less than 12 hours our lives would be so different. We are now parents to a dead child. Worse than that, we are parents to a dead child, not by natural causes, but by murder, and by murder at the hand of someone she and nation loved and cared about and would have done anything in the world for. There is no worse way to live the rest of our lives. When we think about how scared she must have been and how painful the end of her life was, we almost lose our minds. The fact that she was able to go as far as she did lets us know how much she wanted to live. Most of all, we can think about how much she loved when she kept telling Nation she loved him. She loved him. Thank you, ma'am. Your Honor, I appreciate being able to speak to the court today. My name is Teresa Kirk. I'm Jamie's stepmother, and I'm a victim of homicide. This is my life now, an unimaginable hell, a dark, cold world that I can never escape from. I'm a doomed to a life sentence of grief. Jamie's killer did this to me. My Jamie is dead because someone she believed to be one of her best friends wanted to kill her. My beloved only child was brutally murdered. I stood by Jamie's hospital bed and watched her take her last breath in the early morning hours of April 24th, 2013. I sat numb and inconsolable through her funeral. I stare unbelievingly at her urn containing her ashes every day. She is gone and I am left behind. I am now childless. When people ask me if I have children, what do I say? Yes, but she's dead. She was murdered. This is my beautiful Jamie. This is a photo of Jamie and I was taken on her wedding day six years ago at her bridal luncheon. She looks so full of life and happiness, of love and hope and promise, just as she always did. I was so very blessed and most fortunate to be a part of Jamie's life as her stepmother and to have her love. I watched her grow from a sweet baby to a precious little girl to a spirited teen and into a most beautiful, loving, kind, and talented young woman. I continually marveled at her character and poise, her capabilities and convictions. I not only dearly loved Jamie as my child, but I also really admired her and liked her as a person. And she had grown into such an amazing person someone who made a difference in the lives of people. Her ideals were grounded in social awareness. She was committed to making her community better and seemed to possess a real gift to be able to make a difference in her world. I have always been so very proud of her. She is my Jamie, I am Harissa, she is my daughter, and I love and cherish Jamie with all of my heart. Jamie was coming into the prime of her life, a life that was precious to so many. There seemed to be no limits to where her life would take her, but all her hopes and dreams and goals were extinguished in an instant with the continual stabs of her killer's knife. My Jamie was 29 years old. Not a day goes by that I do not painfully grieve for Jamie. I am tormented by her impossible death. My beautiful girl was murdered. Each day I see the heart-wrenching pain that my husband, Chris, Jamie's father, must endure. I feel despairingly sad and I cry a lot. At times I just want to scream at the top of my lungs to rail about the unthinkable, indescribable loss resulting from her murder. I feel disconnected, disoriented, and detached from life. I have a constant ache and longing for Jamie, a desperate desire to have her back, to see Jamie again and be with her, 
to hold her and talk to her and hear her laugh. I'm lonely for Jamie. Every day I see or hear something that I want to share with Jamie, but I can't, not now. She was mercilessly severed from me by this murderer and his knife. What was taken from me can never be returned. The one thing that I want more than anything else, I can never have. It is still incomprehensible to believe after almost two years now that Jamie was murdered and it is terrible to face just how savagely she died. Every second of every day, the intense horror of her death is with me. She is my first thought when I wake up each morning, and she is my last thought as I try to fall asleep each night, another day without Jamie. All I have left of Jamie are my memories of her, and now there's no way we can ever make new ones together. Sometimes it feels like I'm just marking off the days on the calendar until I will hopefully get to be with Jamie again when it is my time to leave this world. The day that Jamie died, a part of me died with her. I am not the same person anymore. I am a shell of what I was. Things that I took joy in and looked forward to before Jamie's murder are now uninteresting. My senses are dulled and my outlook is bleak. There is a void inside of me now that can never be filled, and I will be in mourning for Jamie for the rest of my life. Sorrow is always with me. Grief is a constant undercurrent in my daily life. Before this happened, I lived life. Now I just exist. The magnitude and enormity of Jamie's murder caused me to lose my sense of the world. I've lost the meaning and purpose of life. I've lost my identity. I was a mother, a friend, a teacher, a mentor, and perhaps I would have been a grandmother. The world around me is now completely different in every way and barely recognizable. All my notions of life have been forever altered. I now question every belief I had prior to Jamie's murder. How can I make sense of anything anymore? My day-to-day -day life has been drastically changed. This is a traumatic loss that never ends. The damage in the wake of this inconceivable tragedy will last with me forever. But it's not just my loss that I grieve for. It is Jamie's immense loss, the loss of the life that she was meant to live. Jamie had a wonderful life ahead of her, full of amazing possibilities with her family, her husband, her friends, her work, potential children, potential grandchildren, so very much. And we had such happy plans for the long future together that we thought stretched ahead of us. But all that was violently ripped away in an instant. A very significant part of my life was catastrophically destroyed when Jamie was killed. Now we never get to have our future together. I will never get to share the kitchen again with Jamie, cooking, sharing recipes, laughing and chatting away about everything under the sun. We will never get to take the family trips together that we had all planned. I will never again get to see the unbridled joy in her face as she played with her pets or with ours, as she walked on the beach, as she unwrapped a present, or as she just had a good laugh. I will never receive any more excited emails or happy phone calls about all the events happening in her life. I will never see her children born or watch their futures unfold. I cannot hug her or hear her voice or just watch her as she sits quietly reading. Every birthday, every holiday is now tainted. The life I was to share with Jamie is gone forever. The future without her is so very empty. Jamie was our legacy. I'm shattered to my core and bereft of hope and contentment. My days are long, my nights sleepless. I feel broken and violated, weak, aimless, helpless, depressed, exhausted. I'm in a perpetual state of anxiety. It is hard to function in daily life, and I ask myself, will I ever be happy again? I have to try and create a new existence for myself now. I have to try and figure out how to survive. The world continues on, but mine is frozen in time at the moment of Jamie's murder. I stand here reciting a litany of all the physical and mental pain that has been my life since April 22nd, 2013 permanent and overwhelming that runs deep and forever changed me and my view of the world. Pain that I must in struggle to cope with each day with the help of intense therapy sessions. 
pain that I see heavily etched in my husband's face each day and wish with all my heart that I could ease. And then I feel guilty thinking about myself because I can imagine the horrific pain that Jamie suffered when she was so viciously attacked. My Jamie had to endure the immense physical pain that that, of that knife stabbing her again and again. She must have been so shocked and so scared. She had to fight off her attacker. She had to flee from him with those deep bleeding wounds to get help. What physical, emotional, and spiritual pain she must have felt as she lay collapsed in a neighbor's yard struggling to breathe, bleeding to death, knowing that her friend, her supposed friend, had maliciously taken action to kill her, waiting for the ambulance, dying. This was a most heinous crime and its perpetrator must pay for it to the maximum extent. Absolutely nothing will ever assuage Jamie's lost life or the pain that she endured as she was being stabbed. Nothing will ever heal the unbearable pain that is felt by me and my husband and so many, so very many people every day because of her murder. Jamie deserves justice. It's the last thing we in this earthly world can give her. I say this now to Jamie's killer. She gave you a place to live. She cared for you. You sat at her table for meals. You worked alongside her in her business. You went on trips together. You shared holidays, birthdays, and special events. You watched favorite shows and movies together. You partied together. You shared her friends and her family. Chris and I accepted you into our home and treated you like family. You totally ingratiated yourself into every aspect of her and of our lives. And then you murdered our daughter. You murdered Jamie. I know now firsthand there's evil in the world, and he sits before us in this courtroom as Jamie's killer. This murderer must be held responsible for his unconscionable crime. He must pay for his ruthless actions. He made a choice that day in late April 2013 to end Jamie's life. He must be severely punished for this senseless and brutal act. There's no forgiveness and there should be no mercy. He should be made to suffer the pain of what he did to Jamie every day. He should have everything of meaning taken away from him, and he should be made to feel totally hopeless, just like what he did to me and to my husband. There's no escape from our devastating loss and debilitating suffering, and there's most assuredly should be no escape for Jamie's murderer either. Yes, I have anger and I have rage. My grief is raw. My beloved daughter was murdered. It's unfair for Jamie's killer to have any kind of life when he ended her so savagely. I want payment for the life that was taken from Jamie, the life that was taken from me. I respectfully urge your honor to impose the maximum sentence on this man for the violent murder of my daughter, Jamie Kirk Hahn. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. Sir, Mr. Kirk. I'm Chris Kirk, Jamie's father. Thank you, Mr. Fawcett. Thank you, Your Honor. Jamie's murder and nation's attempted murder has had widespread reverberations, and yesterday the term was used ripple effect. And yes, it had a ripple effect. It continues to have a ripple effect. But for every ripple, there's been someone or a group of someones that have stepped up to try to minimize that and to help those that are affected. And while the family may be the focus right now, 
there's a community and widespread nation that has been affected across the country from a murder this heinous. So we cannot forget there are more victims than just the family you're hearing from today. I would like to thank a few of those people that have been close to this effort itself. First, the Cabes and the Harrells, the two houses, uh, the two families that helped Jamie when she ran to the Harrell house. Those two families were thrust into a crisis situation through no fault of their own, having to act immediately. And they did. They came to Jamie and Nation's aid as quick as they identified that there was a situation. Not only did they tend to Jamie from the standpoint of medically, they also worked to give her some comfort, give her some care, and let her know that someone was there. And as we now know, that life was draining out of her as she lay in the Herald's front yard. From there, they looked after Nation and made sure that he and Jamie had those last moments together. One of the comforts those families have brought us, and we've met with them uh, privately, is that Jamie was not in turmoil. Jamie had physical trauma and knew she was injured. But Jamie was calm and facing the situation as best she could. And that gives us some peace that in those final moments from there, she wasn't in terror herself. I'd also like to thank, as she's been referred to in testimony, the lady riding her bike. We have met with her privately. I do not give her name since she wasn't in testimony from there to protect her privacy. But she also stopped and gave the same care that uh, the McCabe's and the Harrells did. And we appreciate that time she did. And she gave us that same comfort level of being with Jamie in those final moments. There's so many people we won't meet, all the Raleigh police who responded to the 911 call that took John into custody, the ones that made sure that the neighbors were secure. Uh, we have gotten to meet Officer Robert Williams, who rode in the ambulance and helped give Jamie CPR, trying to save her. We've met some of the medical professionals, but not the EMTs, some of the hospital trauma staff, and some of the intensive care staff, but around the clock for 30 hours, they worked to give her a chance to live, and they revived her beyond all odds. And it may have been for naught, but it was an effort, and it gave all of us a chance to at least go in and say goodbye to her. Uh, so many of the homicide detectives worked for months, if not years, to put together the case that's been presented this week. Uh, lead Detective Zeke Morris was totally professional through, through the whole situation. He had care and concern as a family. It just wasn't a technical situation. He kept us well informed. He would initiate phone calls to us, but he would never not return a phone call, even to the point that he had been in trial. And he called us at 10 o'clock one night and said, is this too late? We said, no. We talked 30 minutes about the status at that time. We've had so much help from Elizabeth Wexler Watson. She's director of the North Carolina Victim Assistance Network here in North Carolina. She supported us in numerous ways, ranging from the logistics to helping educate us as to what, to come, what was to come, along with being just a compassionate friend. No one that loses a loved one has any kind of plan in place, and she stepped in to help us. And she and her organization are a true asset here in Wake County and deserve to be embraced by the community and they go by North Carolina van from there and that includes the community should be helping them financially because they have been cut by state funds. In the district attorney's office, Abby Lefevre has been with us from the start. Uh, I said today since June 10th when she came back from uh, maternity leave, but she assured me she had already started on the case before then from there. But she's been an anchor. She always kept us uh, uh, updated. She called us when there was any developments in the case. She made sure we understood each step of the way where we were and where we had it. She kept us in check that this just wasn't going to be an overnight thing. She had care, concern, and compassion beside of her professional abilities. And I still remember the Christmas when she called us from her vacation out of state to give us the update on the hearing, and we appreciated that so much, Abby. Thank you. We just knew you cared. 
Karen Scott, she has come into our life in October once the judicial proceedings started. She became our liaison and she has looked after us pro professionally, even with a maternal focus, which we so appreciate. And it made a difference every day of the last month coming into this courtroom and leaving the courtroom and her checking on us at every break from there. And all the way through, she has make us, made us feel a part of this process and that we have felt that, Karen. Thank you from there. And Doug Fawcett, brilliant. He's diligent, responsible. He has taken this seriously from the first time we ever talked to him on the phone, through meetings we had, and through the last month. We know, Doug, that this has taken a great part of your life mentally and physically in terms of the time that you've had to put in, but you've had nothing but every time we've seen you pure energy. I've never seen you not positive at all in the last 23 months. That gave us a real confidence level, but also shows the professionalism you've brought into this courtroom to get this conviction. And we thank that so much. You gave my wife and I status of co-victims and treated us right along with everybody else as part of this process. And we can never thank you enough. Thank you, Judge Ridgeway, for all your time in and, and representing this case, but we also that probably the court time itself is minuscule compared to your time outside working on this case. And then I would like to thank just three of the citizens here that have stepped in and made a difference in our lives. This has had the media attention. I will say that the local press could not have given us more civility and been more compassionate and worked with us, but there is an awful lot of situations where you have national press, et cetera, that trying to contact you, and three professionals of this area stepped in pro bono. We never knew them before. We've gotten to know them there. We're very close friends, so I would like to thank all of the time that they have come in and helped us and in alphabetical order, Joyce Fitzpatrick, Lee Gates, and Gary Pierce. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the jury. The jury was thrust into that, this doing their civic duty. They gave up a full month of their, of their life. They have been exposed to horrors, not by their doing, and then they were thrust in the position of having to make a decision. And we appreciate what they went through for us, and sorry we can't shake and hug each of them individually, but maybe at one point we'll cross paths with them. Now, I've been working on what they call the victim's impact statement since October, and I've attempted to make this as straightforward as possible and to only take a reasonable amount of the court's time, but it's gonna take me a few minutes to get through all I would like to, Your Honor. Yes, sir. This is my opportunity, yes, sir. my one time. I'm, I'm happy to hear from you, sir. Okay, thank you. One of our inner circle people made the comment to me when I was talking to her about this, how can a person's soul be truly defined in a short period of time? And I took that to heart. The first focus of accountability has to be on Jamie. She is the victim here. She's not present. We, the family, are representing her and being her voice from there. I do have a portion of her with me. It's a bracelet that she weaved for me when she was about 10 years old, and I've worn it every day through court, and I've been blessed to have that here as well as have her in my heart. At the time of her murder, she was the happiest we had ever seen her. She had a loving marriage, she had a successful consulting career, she had a home, she had a pet family, and a broad and deep network of friends. She had matured into a wonderful adult, which we all want to see for our children. She and Nation had begun to talk of having children from there. She had her act together. She loved life, she participated in life. And she was about family, and you don't always see that as children grow up, but she was into everybody together. She concentrated on us. She spent many weeks a year with us, as many as five a year since she was self-employed. She called and e emailed regularly. She would do special events with the parents at the drop of a notice, even if it meant late night arrivals and early morning having to leave the next day. We could always count on her to be there to support us. At weeks before her, Demise, she started a food blog, and in there she talks extensively of what family means to her. Jamie was a very productive member, as most of y'all all know, in society, especially here in Raleigh, where they have been, I guess, five years from here. 
But Jamie started that in high school, and we saw it when she would volunteer to do mentoring programs, or she would do special projects, or she would do things through the church to go to Mexico. She always had something she was working on to think about somebody else, but she was so low-key with it. It was such that she did it because she should, not because people needed to know about it. Uh, she worked with the YMCA here, continuing to mentor people and we still have on our refrigerator the picture of her and her mentee here and the YMCA put on it after her death two lives change forever and we see that every morning we go in to have breakfast from there at her parties here she would have people bring a can of food instead of a hostess gift then she would take that to the food bank after her murder they found on her desk paperwork where she was looking to establish her own nonprofit to help fill holes for those children that are on free lunch that don't always have meals on holidays or on the weekends. She discussed that with us at Christmas of that year and again at that spring, my wife and I are retired CPAs from there and she would talk to us about how to handle the business aspect of it. What could she do to help those people that were in need? Uh, so many people in Raleigh know how many nonprofits that she had been involved in here. Some of it she was hired, some of it was pro bono, and some of it was a, was a combination of both. She organized, she motivated, she delivered, she got formal groups going, she got ad hoc groups going. When they had the visitation the night before her service, and this is a testimonial way bef beyond a father, from there, they estimated about a thousand people were there, and they waited up to two hours to speak to each of the family members. And it was amazing how many people came up to me, and I can't remember who they are today, from there that said, Jamie stepped in, got us going, moved on to her next project. We're making a difference today because Jamie got us started. Jamie's murder reverberates in a widespread manner, and I just think about what all would she have accomplished if she had gotten past that 29th year. Uh, there is a foundation in her name, but there's a number of other charities that have used her name also with the family's blessing to help raise money. And just off the top of my head, I can calculate over $400,000 has been raised, and I just think that's wonderful. And she's 29 years old, and I don't know how she did that. Okay. I'm going to turn negative a little bit. I'm going to talk about Jamie and John. John, you haven't looked up once today, but we know you're hearing, so I hope you take this with you every day of your life. Thank you for looking up from there. There was nobody that loved John Broy Hill more than Jamie. As been said before, he was family, part of her life. She took her, him under her wing personally and professionally. She opened the doors for him to live with them. There were so many times he was at her house more than his own. They did activities together. She fed him. She was a caregiver during his illnesses, and his supposed illnesses affected her so badly and emotionally impacted him from there. These loving emotions for what I thought Mr. Fawcett put well yesterday, we really didn't know John. We knew the facade of John from there. He took her life at age 29, stabbed her 24 times. That is malicious. That is evil. I still today wake up not comprehending that. She was denied life's experiences, and John took away her whole future. And that takes her children and her grandchildren and those of us that would have benefited from that. John denied Jamie the time with her husband, but he also denied they should the time with her. Now, excuse me. Turning to us as parents, we were denied our senior years with her. We can't have those grandchildren. We don't talk to her again. We don't email her again, and we know that possibility's not there. Whenever she came to see us, she, we live in a rural area, have a gravel driveway. We could hear the tires, and she would always honk. And we knew about what time she was arriving, and we would run out of the house and get the hug and the kiss and know we had the best time of our life coming up. I can't hear that anymore. When I hear gravel now, I turn away from the window because I know it's not her. The fact that she was brutally mur murdered carries every day. These were consciously applied stab wounds designed to kill, just as Mr. Fawcett pointed out, and just as the surgeon pointed out to me, it was the most horrific act she had ever seen. 
It was the worst nightmare. We got a cryptic phone call about seven one night after we'd walked our dogs. It took us three hours to unravel what had occurred. We knew not to call Jamie. We tried Nation. Obviously, he wasn't available. So who did we call? The best friend and our adopted nephew, John. Didn't return those calls. We found out eventually that he was the one that committed this act. I drove up five hours in the middle of the night to get here. Thinking as I left town, came by the gas station, I'm overreacting. Yes, something's happened, but it can't be that bad. There will be a recovery and we'll be there for. But every 30 minutes, the phone call that came in was worse. And I finally found out she had coded for 25 minutes in the ambulance and was put on CPR. And that told me we have a real situation on our hands. When I walked in her hospital room, it was the worst scene I had ever had in my life. It's worse than any horror movie that you could ever imagine. She was hooked up to a ventilator. There was a whole myriad of machines, a whole group of people tending to her. And this is brutal, but this is what I saw. She was convulsing. She was having constant spasms. Her eyes were just opening and closing as if she were a little doll. I knew right then that I was there to say goodbye, that I would not have my daughter alive again. I held her hand. I talked with her to this day. I hope she knows that Daddy was there with her. I then went to the hospital waiting room. Now, we know so many people in Raleigh now, but we hardly knew anybody outside that little circle that would be over at Jamie's house when we came to see her. And there was hundreds in there. And they spent from then till 2 o'clock Wednesday morning sitting, comforting, looking after us, trying to help us know that there was support. And the people of Raleigh turned out, and we thank we thank you for what you've done there. There did become a point we had to make that life decision. What do we do? She was, she was chemically maintained. They even talked to us about starting amputations. Can you imagine what a, what a conversation like that's like? The family agreed that the doctors were correct. No brain functions had ever returned. So we let her go, and we let her go naturally. A few months later, I came to Raleigh, I went to her house, and I restate, retraced that route that the lady from, I call CSI for lack of a better term, from there showed us what happened and what we had heard had happened from the families that helped her. I went from her side door, I went to the next side door. Those are big steps she went up for me, and I'm not stabbed. And I went over to the neighborhood, and I walked around the Harrell's house. Bill Harrell came out, talked with me. And I spent some time, because I had to, knowing where she was and where those last moments were. As my wife said, John was an adopted nephew to us. Started with Jamie's engagement. He spent many days in our home. He violated our trust, obviously, but we couldn't believe it was like a family member perpetrated this. I do extensive photography, and I go back now through my library of photos ever since Nation came into our life, and ever since that portion, three-fourths of those photos have John in them. That's how close. He and Jamie would come to visit when Nation couldn't come, and then John would come on his own for holidays when he said he wasn't welcome in his own home. That's how we were with John, and that's how we were so astounded when he found out what really happened. My wife heard an interesting statement by a victim of another tra tragedy. It's always playing in the background, and it is. You can't go a moment without knowing that Jamie's gone permanently. My void will never be filled. It crushes me. And she was just suddenly gone. Just one day, she is totally plucked from my life. The despair is overpowering. I feel an inner tightness constantly. I do break down, and then other times I just keep it inside. But that's what da daily life is like from there. As my wife said, we're working 
with the Greek therapist. We're, we're fortunate to have Dr. Alyssa Reingold in our life from MUSC in Charleston, the Department of Psychiatry. She's the assistant dean there, and she's making a big difference, putting one foot in front of the other. We don't see any end to that help, but we don't want any end to that help. I still take medications part-time to assist my coping. I've had some physical ailments I've been treated for medically due to the stress that has affected me. Just a few months prior to murder, my wife and I play, made plans to retire. And sometimes you, don't, you wonder how things happen in life. And that February, I told my wife, it's time to retire. And she said, no, we've got a few good years left. I said, I'm five years older. I don't know that I have some more work years left from there. And I said, I think we need to retire this year. And uh, we are, we're tax accountants primarily at that time, so we could start telling our clients what that we were moving out, and here was the fellow that would take over. Well, I did this for three days, even wake up in the middle of the night saying, it's time to retire. And finally, on the third morning, and I knew I was risking pushing a point, my wife said, I don't understand your reasoning. And I said to her, I don't understand it either. But Teresa, there's a reason in our life we're going to want to have already moved on from these responsibilities. Now, I may have known that somehow, some way, but I wish I'd known the reason that I would have stopped it. I'm suspicious now of others. I'm, 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 I'm a very much an isolationist. There's no closure, but we had to get through this to get this part put through. John, you gave Jamie a death sentence. You gave all the rest of us a life sentence, and now you can share in that life sentence, John. I do want to close positively. There are so many charitable and social efforts underway because of Jamie's death and the publicity that has surrounded it. And besides those organized approaches, there's so many individuals that have told us that she's motivated them just to get up and do something individually for somebody else. And that means so much to us. So there's a legacy there that's being geometrically applied throughout Raleigh and in some, some cases throughout the nation. I myself am going uh, to school in April to get certified in my state of South Carolina as a victim's service provider and our local solicitor's office, which is the equivalent of the DA's office, already has me a volunteer position set aside so I can start then and that way I can daily honor Jamie in a way, I can help other victims, and that will give me a reason to get up in the mornings. In closing, one of the things that I have done uh, in the last year and a half is collect quotes. Whenever I hear a quote that I think is applicable, and it could be from a book, person, TV, movie, etc., I put it into a Word file in my iPad. And right now, I've got about 4,500 words in there. From there, some of them reflect the horror, but many of them are the motivation. And here's one I'd like to share, just to leave this on a positive note. This is Waylon Henry Cato Sr., Cato Stores. He's buried in Charleston, South Carolina. And on his tombstone it says, To live in hearts we leave behind is not to die. Let me say that one more time. To live in hearts we leave behind is not to die. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. Good morning, Mr. Hahn. Good morning. Um, I've thought of this day a lot over the last year and a half. Um, I want to say first to you, um, while I believe that justice was served, in a, in a sense, there's nothing just or fair about a world without Jamie. 
And so I tend to prefer to look at this as accountability for someone who needlessly, needlessly took her out of so many lives. Um, so I hope that you'll hold this murderer accountable. We've learned so much about the evil uh, that exists in this world, um, evil that is represented today with this murderer in front of us um, who won't look up. But we've also learned much about the good. Everyone who's here today, everyone who's been there from the beginning, have helped us survive the unsurvivable. Mr. Arbor, yesterday you said your client was at a point where he was ready to die. Well, first he had to take our lives. The evidence shows that. But I want to make a point that, you know, I can empathize with those feelings you were describing. Because of your client, I was ready to die for a very, very, very long time. I walked around buildings and thought about jumping off of them. I didn't wear my seatbelt because I hoped somebody would hit me. So I can empathize with those feelings you described. I can empathize with the feelings of wanting to die. Because until you've had someone who you love taken from you, you'll never know what it is to hit a valley so deep that you can't see a way out. So deep that you can't imagine ever seeing the light again. But because of so many, because of so many, we've seen points of light. Because of Jamie's light, we've survived. We survived in a world without her, thanks to your client, but we've survived. So many of those heroes are represented by Doug, who's the only person who could get me into a bow tie. <laughs> by Abby, who was there when I, in low moments, who, Karen, who told me I could make it through another day of Joe Arbor's cross-examination. No offense, Joe. Um, the people who were there in the yards, the people who were there in the hospital, the people who helped us found a foundation in Jamie's honor, the family members who, and friends, the friend who would stay up with me, you know, the real friends who would stay up with me <clears throat> when I couldn't sleep, when I didn't want to sleep. Um, so while we've learned there's evil in the world, we've also learned so much about the essential goodness of others. And I hope that people will take a lesson from the way Jamie lived. It's easy to trust less. It's easy to be suspicious. It's easy to not take people at face value. And because of your client, I've done a lot of that, Mr. Arbor. But I think the lesson that Jamie would want us all to know is that we should still be open to the essential goodness of so many. Jamie lost her life not because she was too trusting or too open. She lost her life because John Brohill's evil. And, you know, we, we lock our doors at night to keep the outside world, to keep evil out, right? But what happens when evil has a key? Can't prepare for that. You know, as I wrestled with what to say, you know, I, there were a lot of curse words I thought were appropriate, but I didn't want Judge Ridgeway to get too mad at me. Um, so I'll keep those to myself and maybe go on a run later and scream them out. Um, but instead, I wanted to end with Jamie's words. When John, who, hey John, if you want to look up, you can. When he told us that he had pancreatic cancer, when he collapsed in my arms sobbing, telling me that he was worried that he had faced a death sentence, we had no way of knowing he intended to mete out his own death sentence to the two of us. What speaks to Jamie's essential character is she, essentially, is she immediately went into, I'm going to take care of this, we're going to fix this, how can we help? She went upstairs, she used the restroom, she came back downstairs. We sat with him for several hours. When we went to bed that night, as I described in testimony, I went to the restroom, and I completed that restroom visit, Mr. Arbor. 
I went to the restroom, and I came back out, and I laid in bed with my iPad. I was probably sending e-chats, Mr. Arbor. And Jamie started crying, convulsing in tears. And I held her in my arms, and I said, you know, things are going to be okay. She revealed to me that she had gone upstairs earlier when I thought she was using the restroom to cry because she thought a person that she cared so deeply about, that we both cared so deeply about, was facing a death sentence. She looked at me and with a voice that I could not come close to replicating, but it can only describe as a Jamie voice. She said, don't you think we should have a baby? We'll never have that, thanks to John over there. And I said, well, you know, now's not the time, sweetie. You know, we have this person who we have to take care of. We have so many responsibilities. And she said, well, but I want our baby to know the people we care about. Like your client. I'm just going to close with her words because she can't speak for herself any longer. Thanks to John. She wrote a blog. The morning of our anniversary, I came outside, and she was, in very Jamie fashion, handwriting her blog, which I didn't quite understand because the blog is online. Doug wouldn't know about it because he doesn't use computers. And Mr. Arbor, I think you may know a little bit about it, but I'll give you a lesson later. She was handwriting it, and I still have this handwritten version. Um, that night, she would be typing it up, and this was on the night of our anniversary is when she posted this. It's entitled, My Wake Up Call. I've been making, this is, these are her words, I've been making changes and usually not sticking to them under the guise of being healthy for as long as I can remember. But let's be honest, to me, healthy equals skinny. Even when there wasn't much left to lose, I've been trying every health, read, diet, trick I could find and convincing myself it was healthy. And she went on to talk about a marathon that she <clears throat> intended to run. And then she said, then finally in the last two weeks, my wake-up call came like the good health police banging down my door and tasering me until I cooperated. Last week, one of our very good friends was di diagnosed with cancer. She wrote in parentheses, don't ask me who, it's not my place to say, but she meant John Broyhill. I hope you're hearing this, John, because this is about you. She said, after learning that news, my entire world changed, especially my thoughts on what does it mean to be healthy. I vowed then and there to truly, stay tar to truly to start truly taking care of my body and my outward appearance no longer mattered. What matters most is that my insides are happy and healthy. So as is my nature, upon hearing this cancer diagnosis, this false cancer diagnosis, this lie that was intended to deceive, she didn't write that part, but we found that out later. I immediately went into overdrive in my how can we fix this mode. As I often do when I'm trying to learn about new things or try new things, I look to reading books, magazines, and the internet. It turns out, by being healthy and living a healthy, clean lifestyle, that in addition to making myself less likely to develop diseases such as cancer, that that whole weight management thing will just work itself out. So be on the lookout for a few changes. After the last week and being faced with the ultimate wake-up call, the big C, that lie, she didn't say that, I said that, I'm on a mission to do everything possible to not only prevent us from getting it, but to help our friends read family who are facing this get better. She was talking about your client who murdered her, by the way, Mr. Arbor. Because for Nation and I, four years ago today, after we said I do, our lives are about to change again. And I'm committed to making that change be for the better. She wouldn't have a chance. We have now recommitted ourselves to our own personal health, but to also being better spouses, better friends to ourselves and others, and committed to our families. If you know anything about us, you know that it extends to way more than moms, dads, aunts, uncles, and cousins. She thought everyone was our family. 
She said, we'll all be living health, ha healthy ever after. She didn't have that opportunity. I have a um, necklace that I carry with me that has her wedding band inside of it. And it has six symbols that are relevant to us. But on one side, it has her handwriting, and it says, I love you to the moon. That's how she signed her last anniversary card that same day that she wrote this blog. Something that I'll always be thankful for was the opportunity to say I love you to the most wonderful person I've ever known. You know, I thought she was going to make it. She's so strong, so strong. She was a fighter. But, you know, we don't win by surviving, we win by the fight that we show, by the strength that we show, by the character that we show. And that was how Jamie lived her life. And she tried to give that same strength, that same care, that same compassion to John Broyhill because she loved him too. I would give anything, 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 anything to hold her in my arms, to see her make this, what I refer to as a frog face when she was getting ready to kiss me, to kiss her, to hold her, to tell her I love her again, but I can't. But I hope that everyone will do what I try to do every day, which is take some of her with us, some of her essential goodness, some of her love for others, her care, her concern, her compassion. Because we never really die as long as there are people who love us, who carry our example forward. And all of us who knew Jamie know that that spirit will carry forward with all of us. John, you, tried, you killed her. You tried to kill me. But you can't kill her spirit. You can't kill what it was that made her so special. You can't cut her spirit out with that knife. And you couldn't stop her love for you even if you tried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hahn. Yes, sir, Mr. Fawcett. If I may approach, <clears throat> this time the state of great judgment is a prior record level one for the separate crimes against the nation of Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Arbor, do you wish to be heard on behalf of 